Welcome back to this course. Now, what we have discussed in the last class is about the different modeling technique. We have discussed about the algebraic slip model, we have discussed about the Euler Euler model, we have discussed about the Euler Lagrangian model, and while presenting those models, I always say that there is a limitation for each modeling method. And why there is a limitation? Because you assume something which may or may not valid or we use some drag closure or some closure like a drag closure which may or may not be applicable for the system you are investigating or you are trying to understand. And therefore, we I have shown you a slide where I said that there is a different techniques available, but each technique have their own limitation. You are using some model which is not scientifically developed, which is developed based on certain assumption and therefore, it is important to validate experimentally your simulation data. And for experimentally validation of the data, what you need, you need some measurement technique which can perform the or we can measure the condition at the condition you want to do the measurement with the accuracy or with the desired accuracy. And the second thing, you need a technique which can be used at all the scales if possible with the equal accuracy and that will give you the luxury to do your numerical simulation at a smaller scale first, then you go for a higher scale, you see that how your numerical simulation predictions are being done and whether those predictions are matching with the experimental measurements or not. So, what you need? You have to do the first numerical simulation for the say laboratory scale system because that will be easy to simulate, that will take less time to simulate. Then you do the validation at your numerical simulation, numerical techniques at the laboratory scale at a smaller scale by using some experimental measurements. Now, you can use the same model which you have validated at laboratory scale to do the scale up, see the phenomenon at a larger scale or say pilot plant scale or even industrial scale, do some measurement at that scale also to see that your scale up or the model which has been used or validated at laboratory scale is working fine even at a larger scale. That need to be done and that exercise needed one thing and that is called measurements of the flow parameters. Now, as I said that already that in multiphase flow measurement, once I am talking about the measurements, actually I talk about the two quantities. I want to understand the two quantities, one is velocity and the other one is the phase fraction. And we have already discussed that these two parameters, whether it is the velocity or the phase fraction in any multiphase flow reactors or process vessels, it is a function of position, it is the function of time. It means you need to measure this parameters and you need to measure the parameter with the position and with the time. And the thing required is that the measurement should be accurate, it should give a high spatial resolution, it means with the position the accuracy is very high, it should have a very high temporal resolution, it means with the time the accuracy should be higher and you need the technique which can be used at all the scale with the equal accuracy. So, that is the requirement is there and that requirement will fulfill your job if you want to validate your numerical simulations or numerical model which you have developed and the validation is must because we are using several things or several uh, closures or several equations which are empirically developed and because they are empirically developed you need experimental validation. Now, if you want a experimental validation then one need to understand that what are the methods you can use or what are the technique you can use to experimentally measure the parameter, what is the limitation of these techniques. In the introduction classes, I have already said that why the multiphase flow is still as a major challenge as a field of research because there is a region that there is no single numerical method available or numerical technique available which can do the prediction at all the scale with the equal accuracy for all the system. Similarly, there is no measurement techniques available which can measure the phenomenon at all the scale with the equal accuracy and that creates a problem. So, what we are going to discuss in this part first is that what are the different measurement techniques available. I will briefly cover them because there is still is a big topic of research, big topic of studies. So, it will take huge time. So, what I am going to do, I am going to give you a glimpse of the different measurement techniques which can be used in the multiphase flow reactors 
we will try to understand the capability, the limitation of each technique and the capability of each technique and based on that on your system of choice, the system you want to study, the model you have used and the parameter which you want to understand, you can use this technique, you can choose one of the technique to validate your numerical simulation or to validate your numerical model. So, therefore, what I am going to do in this class, we are going to briefly discuss about the measurement techniques available for the multiphase flow reactors. Now, the major challenge why you need a dedicated measurement techniques because most of the single phase flow measurement techniques suppose if I want to measure the velocity, I want to measure the mass flow rate. So, most of the technique which is being used cannot be used here because of the multiphase flow nature of the flow. So, suppose if you want to use rotameter, you want to use the rotameter for two phase flow, you cannot do that because rotameter what you do, you calculate the drag. Now, once there will be a gas flow, drag will be different. Once there will be a liquid flow, the drag will be different because there you have a density of the continuous phase and that depends on the Reynolds number and again that will be going to be depend on the density and viscosity of the continuous phase. So, therefore, the based on that you cannot use the rotameter, similar problem comes with the Venturi, similar problem comes with the your orifice meter and all. So, you cannot measure that. Second thing in the numerical simulation whatever we are doing as I said that we are solving a detailed equation. So, if you just validate it with the superficial velocity, it will be a very crude crude validation and you cannot trust that the validation is correct or not, your model has been rigorously validated or not. So, the rigorous validation of the model is needed because you are using those model to predict the flow phenomena inside the reactor. So, the measuring the global parameter and validating your model with the global parameters a superficial velocity is not a good idea. You will not able to conclude whether your model is working fine or it is not working fine. So, what you need? You need a local information, you need an average information, but that should be inside the system and definitely you need a validation for the mean velocities inside, mean volume fraction inside, but you also need the validation for the local condition or the fluctuating velocity and fluctuating component of the volume fraction, that how the volume fraction is changing with the time. And then well you can say that your model is able to predict the flow conditions with a high accuracy and therefore, the techniques should also have a capability to do so. And to do that what we need, we use some sophisticated technique to measure the flow parameter and those measurement techniques actually we divide in two parts, one is velocity measurement technique and second one is the phase fraction measurement technique. So, these two techniques we are going to discuss and we will briefly discuss this. Again, I am saying I am not going in detail of this, I will just give an overview. So, that based on your model, based on the model which you have developed, the parameter you want to validate, you can use a suitable technique. Let us start with the velocity measurement technique here. Velocity measurement technique or any measurement technique actually is divided in two part. One is called invasive, another one is called non-invasive. Now, what does the invasive means? As the name suggests, it means you are intruding something inside the flow. So, suppose there is a pipeline where the fluid is flowing, gas and liquid both are flowing, say gas and liquid both are flowing. You want to measure the velocity, what you do? You intrude some probe inside and that is called intrusive. Once you intrude something inside, some probe inside of the flow to measure the velocity field or to measure the flow parameter, that thing is called, that technique is called intrusive measurement technique. Now, this technique generally is very low cost technique, it is cheap, it gives sometimes a direct measurement, but the major problem is because you are intruding something inside, you may change the flow physics at the point of measurement itself. So, it means the flow dynamics of the system may change and that to be at the point of measurement itself and that is the major limitation of the intrusive technique, but still these techniques are widely used in industry, in research mainly because these techniques are very low cost technique, you can easily use this technique. The this gives mostly direct measurement and therefore, it is relatively simpler to use this technique for the measurements. So, if you are able to assure that your flow change in the flow is not big, you do not need that much accuracy and you are able to maintain in such a way the condition that it is not changing much, the dynamics is not changing the much, you can use intrusive technique for the measurement of the flow quantities like velocity or volume fraction. 
But if you are not very sure about it, you need a very high accuracy, the non-invasive technique are the option where we used to measure from the outside, we do not disturb the flow. Now, the moment you do not disturb the flow, what you are going to do? You are going to do the indirect measurement. It means you will measure something else and you will convert that in terms of the velocity. And therefore, there is always a problem is a back reconstruction problem. So, the reconstruction becomes an issue and kind of applicability of each technique or the accuracy of each technique will be depending upon the position, the reconstruction algorithm you use and the method you use to measure the flow quantity. Somewhere like we use camera, somewhere we use laser, somewhere we use kind of radiation. So, depending upon what is you are using, your accuracy of the system is going to be a get affected because of that. In invasive technique, velocity measurement technique, which is again I said that it is not that much accurate because the flow can change at the point of measurement, but is still very low cost and that is why it is still very attractive. And the accuracy can be maintained up to the desired limit if you are able to understand the condition requirement or you are able to maintain the flow condition within that. So, invasive technique is divided in three parts or this is not only three, there are many others, but there are mainly three techniques which is widely used. One is pitot tube, hot vinometer and optical fiber probe. Now, pitot tube nowadays is not being used widely because there are other measurement techniques is there, invasive measurement technique is there. But still I would like to say the pitot tube because most of you have already done the pitot tube undergraduate studies or in your fluid flow courses. So, I will throw the pitot tube, I will try to give the brief difference between the pitot tube whatever you have studied and how it is being used for the multiphase flow. Then we will move towards the hot vinometer and optical fiber probe and then we will discuss the non-invasive technique under which I will mainly discuss about the PIV, LDA, laser Doppler vinometer particle image velocimetry, positron emission particle tracking and radioactive particle tracking. So, this technique I will be discussing briefly. So, start with the pitot tube as we know that how the pitot tube work, there is a tube inside, there is a flow suppose in a pipeline you use a pitot tube which will be like this and you connect this pitot tube with the YouTube manometer to measure the pressure drop that how it will be the pressure drop will be there. And how it is being measured that the streamline suppose the fluid which will be coming here once it will come and hit at this place, it will achieve the stagnation pressure. Once the it achieve the stagnation pressure, it means its velocity will go to 0, the pressure will increase and because of that you will see the deflection in the manometer fluid. And this height change in the manometer fluid can be correlated with the velocity by using the Bernoulli equation. So, that is the basic principle of the pitot tube which you have already done and that can be measured that velocity can be measured as V will be equal to under root 2 delta P upon rho. So, that is the way you measure that this delta P will be the manometer reading and that can be calculated as rho of the fluid minus rho of manometer into G into delta H. So, that is the way delta H can be calc delta P can be calculated. You can use the Bernoulli equation to calculate the velocity. So, that is the very basic principle of measuring the flow by using the pitot tube. But the major problem with the pitot tube with this kind of a pitot tube is there is a multiphase flow reactors. So, what we measure that the delta P how we measure that we measure it at a wall wall tap which is at the full condition we are somewhere at this location and one pressure which we are measuring at the stagnation pressure. But in multiphase flow actually we assume that this pressure whatever you are measuring is going to be the static head pressure and that you can be kind of be constant everywhere. But in multiphase flow what will happen because the phase distributions are there, there will be bubble say gas liquid system, there will be bubble, there will be liquid phase flow. So, what you need this is static the pressure should be measured near the stagnation pressure and to do that what we do we use 5 point probes or 6 point probes where we have a central probe where the velocity will be kind of stagnation pressure will be achieved, it will be measured and other probe we, we put other holes we put on the periphery of this probe, this uh, central hole like this you can see that there are different holes here on the periphery of this and they are actually 45 degree apart. So, this angle we have maintained at around 45 degrees so that they did not see the stagnation pressure directly and the stagnation pressure effect will be there only at the central location. So, this pressure will be realized and this pressure combined will give you the average pressure around that central probe and you measure the delta P by the average of this say if there is a 4 hole you will measure P 2, P 3, P 4, P 5. So, say this is P 2, 
this is P3, this is P4, this is P5 and this say is P. P1. You measure that pressure as do you calculate the average pressure from all this probe, you calculate this P bar will be P2 plus P3 plus P4 plus P5 upon 4 because there are 4 probes and V will be equal to under root of 2 P1 minus P bar upon rho and that way you calculate the velocity. So, this is the method which we use in the pitot tube to measure the velocity of the flow. The first problem is a point measurement, it is measuring the velocity only at one location. So, our dream to measure the flow phenomena with the position with the time will not be fulfilled. Okay, you can measure with the time, but you cannot measure with the position. So, if you want to measure with the position, what you need to do? You have to insert several pitot tube inside the flow or you have to use the same pitot tube and you have to keep it at the different location for the different time. So, if you put the several pitot tube inside the flow, definitely the intrusive nature will increase, the disturbance will be very, very high and therefore, the error in the measurement will also be very high. If you use the same pitot tube and place it at different location, then you will not able to get a cross correlation or the correlation between the change in the flow at the center of the column and the change in the flow near the wall at the same time. That luxury will be missing, that information will be missing and therefore, this you will not able to get the detailed information. Second thing is that this probe because you are intruding inside cannot be used for the solid system because what will happen the solid will go and choke all these holes, they will go and sit inside all these holes. So, there will be problem will be created. Second we know that if the bubble coalescence take place or bubble bursting take place, the bubble dead or bubble generation both whether be bubble generation due to the coalescence or bubble death due to the kind of uh, bursting of the bubble, what will happen you will see a huge difference in the pressure and that huge difference in the pressure will be recorded by these 4 probes and therefore, the delta P reading itself will be very, very difficult to measure and that is put another challenge in the pitot tube. So, that is the limit the application of the pitot tube for the solid system a very dense system in the gas liquid and the dilute system you can still use it where the bubble coalescence or bubble bursting phenomena can be minimized. So, this is about the pitot tube is there, it is used a lot in the industry or for the measurement particularly in the late 80s where people have used the pitot tube for the measurements in the multiphase flow reactors. But slowly the use of the pitot tube has been reduced in the multiphase flow reactors and it is limited mainly to the single phase flow or a very mild conditions of the multiphase flow reactors like measuring the velocity of the aeroplane and all you can still use the pitot tube. What we did there is a limitation in the pitot tube and therefore, a new technique has been invented and that is called hot vinometer. Now, hot vinometer for single phase flow is very, very accurate and most of the turbulence analysis has been done with by using the hot vinometer in the single phase flow and because it was very accurate for the single phase flow the same technique has been tried to implement in the multi-phase flow reactors too. So, what we do here in the hot wire meter, we use a wire definitely as the name suggests there is a wire which is maintained at a certain temperature or certain condition. Now, how it is being maintained or what condition it has been maintained this has been there is two type of hot wire meter, one is constant temperature hot wire meter, another one is constant current hot wire meter. So, we say that constant temperature HWA and there is a constant current hot wire meter. So, based on how you are maintaining the condition of this wire, we have a constant temperature, we have a constant current hot wire meters. So, what we do there is wire which we insert inside and let us assume that we are using the constant temperature hot wire meter. This wire is a part of a wheat stone bridge circuit. So, we know that what is the wheat stone bridge circuit. So, suppose there is resistance So, this is R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4. So, we know that R 1 upon R 2 will be equal to R 3 upon R 4. So, the resistance will be in equilibrium and therefore, what will happen is some current will be passed. Some current if we connect to the voltmeter, this will be there, a constant current will be maintained. 
Now, if you change the any of the resistance what will happen there will be change in the current and that change in the current can be recorded in terms of the change in the voltage. That is the basic principle is being used. Now, how the resistance will be changed? So, what we do we put one of the resistance say this of the resistance I extend it and I put this resistance which is nothing but a small wire in the flow. So, like this is the resistance one, one resistance of the Wheatstone bridge and that is being suspended or that has been put in the flow condition. Now, what will happen suppose if I give a initial voltage or reference current or reference voltage then some current will pass through this wire and because some currents will pass through this wire there will be certain energy or certain temperature will be maintained to the wire because we know that the power will be equal to what I square R that will be the power which will be supplied to the wire. Now, we are supplying some power we are supplying some current so the wire will be maintained at a certain temperature. Now, the moment you put this wire into the flow what will happen because of the flow the temperature will try to go down there will be heat loss which will be taking place from the wire to the fluid and because of that heat loss what will happen the wire temperature will change. Now, we know that the temperature and the resistance is directly correlated. So, if you temperature will change your resistance will also change and therefore, the current pass this, this whole combination will be different. And because to maintain this condition what we need to do you have to supply the extra current and that extra current supply can be recorded in terms of the change in the voltage which you need to do to supply the extra current. So, what you will get you will see that your voltage requirement will change and the voltage requirement change is correlated with the velocity by using the King's law where it is saying that E square where E is the voltage output will be equal to A plus b into velocity raised to the power 0 0.5. So, you record the change in the voltage and that cause because of the change in the temperature which is taking place and if you want to maintain the same temperature of the wire what you need to do you have to supply the extra current and to supply the extra current you have to give the extra voltage. So, that change in the voltage you record and that change in the voltage is being correlated with the King's law. King's law which says that E square is equal to A plus B into U raised to the power 0 0.5 where U is the velocity, U is the velocity and E is the voltage. Do this and you measure the voltage change and that voltage change is correlated with the velocity. Now, what we need to do here you see that we need a constant A and B which is the constant this convective constants of the King's law equation and therefore, what you need you need a calibration. So, what you are doing is an indirect measurement you are not measuring the velocity we are measuring the change in the voltage and that change in the voltage. So, what you need to do you need to do the calibration. So, what we do we put the hot wire in the flow and we operate it at a different known velocities. So, what we have we know the u we give a reference current. So, we know that what is the temperature and then based on the velocity the cooling will take place and therefore, you increase you to maintain the constant temperature this condition of constant HWA you need to supply extra voltage and that voltage to u graph we measure then we plot it equate this plot it between the u square and u raised to the power 0.5. Now, if you do this plot you will get a straight line which will intersect on the y axis that intersect is A and the slope of this curve will be B. So, you get A and B values and based on that A and B value you can find the constants. Now, you can insert this probe into the flow where you do not know the velocity you will get the voltage output again and by using this constant which you have already found by using the calibration you can calculate the velocity of the flow. So, that is the basic principle we use in hot wire anemometer. It can be operated either you maintain the temperature constant or you let the change the temperature and you maintain the constant current. So, in both the cases you can operate it there are different equations are available. I am not going in detail of those application if you are interested you can discuss with me or you can go through the books or literature which is based on the hot wire anemometer. But that is the basic principle as I discussed of the hot wire anemometer to measure the flow rate. Now, the major thing of the hot wire anemometer is that we are using only convective loss, loss of the current or loss of the temperature 
because of the convection and that to be the forced convection and therefore, this hot fire meter cannot be used for very low velocity where the natural convection may also dominate, the conduction may also dominate, the radiation losses may also dominate. So, we are neglected all this losses while using the King's law and we have said that only the loss because of the forced convection is being accounted and because only the loss because of the forced convection has been accounted, you cannot use the hot wire meter for a very low velocity system. So, generally or typically for the velocity of more than 1 meter per second, hot wire meter are being used. So, if your flow is having a very low velocity, HWA cannot be used. Then this different HWA is available, different type of HWA is available depending upon number of wires you use. So, suppose there is a single wire hot wire meter like this, what will happen? You will get only one dimensional velocity because there is only one wire, you will get the average velocity of one dimensional, the average velocity you will get. But if you want both x and y velocity, what you need? You need two wires. So, one wire will be, it is called x wires. So, there will be one flow in this direction, another will be say if the flow is in this direction say, what will happen for each wire, it will form an angle say this is the flow, this flow is coming at it in this direction, it will form an angle and this flow can be divided into the, so this will be one component of the velocity say it will be u sin theta and this will be the u cos theta if u is the velocity. So, u sin theta is the x component of the velocity, so you will say y component of the velocity it will be u y, this is the u x. So, you will get both x and y component of the velocity, it means you will get both the directional velocity x and y. If you will have only one wire, you will get only one directional velocity. So, to measure the two direction velocity, we use x wire. Similarly, if we want three directional velocity, we use triple split wire, where there is a three wires there and you have those wires are aligned at a particular angle. You do this component wise analysis again and you get all the three component of the velocities. So, that is the way hot wire anemometry is used. This is used the similar way it is being used in the multi-phase flow. Generally, whatever the way I told you, it is being used in the single phase flow also. The multi-phase flow, there is one more challenge and that challenge is to identify the phase because both the phases are present inside. So, what will happen? The cooling of the wire will be happen because of both the phases. So, what you need to do? Your job has increased. It is in single phase flow, you just measure the voltage change and that voltage change we recorded in terms of the velocity or we calibrate in terms of the velocity. Now, here two label calibration need to be done and why the two label calibration need to be done? Because we know that the thermal resistance or thermal property of each phase or each material is different. So, suppose in a gas liquid system, if the gas is coming in contact with the wire, the rate of cooling will be different. If the liquid is coming in contact of the wire, rate of cooling will be different. Why? Because their heat capacity, their thermal conductivities are different and therefore, you need another label calibration. You first need a calibration, you have to do the same calibration A and B for the air, you have to do the same calibration for the water. You need to see that for the velocity how much for the same velocity change how much voltage change will be required once the air comes into the contact what is the ground level voltage for the air, what is the ground level voltage for the water and based on that voltage you do the phase discrimination. So, like this is a typical example which is taken by the Herrench and Davis paper of 1974. They have tried to show that if you put the hot wireometer in two phase flow, you will get the voltage at two label. One is once the water comes into the contact, another one is once air comes into the contact. So, you get the two different voltage label. You need to have the calibration for both the phases. You identify with the label that okay, if the voltage label at this scale, at this range, you are actually, you will have air. If the voltage label comes to the ground state at this stage, you are having water in contact. So, you define the phase, you find it out the phase here that which phase is coming into the contact. You use the King's law, once that phase is in contact, you depend on the, that what is the voltage change required and you do that calculate the velocity. This is the basic principle is being used in hot wire meter, but the problem is you are intruding this flow something inside which may change flow at the point of measurement. 
second thing is that if you use only one wire the intrusive nature will be less for sure, but you will get only one direction velocity or average velocity you will not get the velocity with the all the three component of the velocity. If you intrude the triplet split wire then the support systems are very very big. So, they though the wire thickness is small the support which actually hold the wire that dimensions will be big. So, overall assembly size will increase and that will may change the flow at the point of measurement itself. So, that is the major problem. Second thing is that the reverse flow condition is also create a problem because the cooling will be the same whether the fluid is moving from bottom to the top at the same velocity or it is coming from the top to the bottom at the same velocity. So, the reverse flow conditions you cannot actually measure it you can not able to identify whether the flow is moving up or flow is coming down. So, therefore, a condition where the reverse flow is possibility of the reverse flow is there hot vinometer will not able to give you the direction of the flow. So, these are the major limitation further again the wire thickness is very small if you are having solid present in the flow the solid amount is very high then what will happen the wire will break because the solid will go and hit the wire. So, it will erode the wire and because the wire thickness is very very small it will immediately break. So, you cannot use this system for high solid hold up system for the gas liquid system you can use it, but the intrusive nature will increase if you will use the triple split wire for the solid anyway you cannot use it or for any hostile medium say very acidic solution very corrosive liquid you cannot use it. Why? Because or very scaling liquid which is very susceptible to scaling you cannot use it. Why? Because if some layer will deposit it or it will be eroded then what will happen your this calibration will change and therefore, you cannot use the same calibration for the measurement. So, that need to be careful and that limits the application of hard wire meter. Next is optical fiber probe. Now, with the generation of optical fiber probes or development of the optical fiber probes people have tried to use the same technique or same thing in the multiphase flow for the velocity measurement. Now, what is the problem in hot wire meter what I said that you will not able to get that whether the flow is reverse or not. You cannot use this system for a very hostile medium. Second thing is that the major problem of the hot wire meter is that if suppose the density is very high then of discrete phase fraction solid particularly you are using and solid discrete phase fraction is very high then it will break the wire. Okay. So, hot wire optical fiber probe actually gives the better accuracy because it depends on the light. Okay. So, what we do we use the two probes one is the light emitting wire another wire is there inside which is light absorbing wire or light receiving wire. So, in one wire this is say optical fiber probe casing there is a two wire inside. So, this is say it work it in this way this is the casing there is one wire and there is a second wire. So, what happen this wire actually emits the light now there will be a phage now each phage will have a different refractive index. So, the light emitted by the each phase will be different. So, that what will happen this suppose there is a gas liquid system once the bubble comes into the contact of this light the refractive index of the air say air water system I am talking about is refractive index of air is 1 water is 1.34. So, now the reflection intensity will be changed and what will happen you will see the different reflection intensity this will the reflection will be different. So, the intensity recorded on this fiber or with the which is connected to the photo detectors will be different. So, what will happen again you will get the two label of the first voltage and this intensity recorded on the photo detector is directly proportional to the current generated or current uh, this generated by the photo detectors. So, photo detectors how it works once there is a photo detector in which there is some metal which once the photon goes and interact with that material it eliminates some photo electrons. That photo electrons actually goes to the photo cathode and generate a electron that electron is being actually passed through the several diodes. So, that the intensity that electron intensity can be amplified and then it reach to the anode and produce a current. So, the amount of current produced is proportional to or correlated with the amount of intensity recorded on the photo detectors. So, we know the phases we know the refractive index of the phases. So, we know that the reflection index that how much ref light will be reflected by a phase we will find that how much current recorded on the photo detector or will be produced. So, from there we can identify the phages. So, you do the phage identification by this method whether it is a air or it is a water. 
and that phase identification once it is done we measure the velocity and how we measure the velocity we measure the velocity by using either the two point optical fiber probe or four point optical fiber probe. So, what happens in the optical fiber probe the two point optical fiber probe again we have a two probes. So, if you see there is a two needle and they are having a distance this is the second needle this is the first needle they are delta L a distance we know that what is the delta L between that two needles. So, what will happen you insert it in inside the flow now suppose there is a gas liquid system ok. So, there is a gas liquid system the gas is being complete continuously sparsed it is forming some bubble now you insert say two pin probe. Okay, I am just introducing the two pin probe. Now, this is the pin, the distance is say delta L, we know that. What will happen? Now, both the probes is emitting light, emitting also light and adsorbing also light, both the probes are doing the same job. So, once a bubble will come in contact with this, what will happen? You will see that now the intensity recorded on the detector will change, because now the bubble is coming which have a different refractive index. So, you will see the similarly the change in the current. Now, the change in the current or change in the voltage will be termed as which phase is coming in contact with that needle or that phase needle. Now, this bubble will pierce through this needle because this needle thickness is very very small it is in the range of 5 to 15 micrometer or even lower now with the more development this is they are trying to reduce the needle diameter. So, this bubble will actually penetrate through this needle or it will pierce through this needle and it will go to the second needle. Now, again what will happen you will on the second needle which was earlier in the water you were recording a different current or different voltage that voltage will change and it will go or the output signal say in terms of the voltage will change. So, earlier say it was going on this way it will increase and it will go to a new label. So, moment it will go to the new label we understand that now the new phase comes into the contact with the other needle also the same phase. So, say if I am using two probe needle I will get two such signal one signal will be like this for the probe one another signal will be like this for probe two. So, what will happen we know the delta t that how much delta t it is taken time taken from by the bubble to travel from this location of first needle to the second needle we know that delta t we know that delta l the velocity can be calculated by delta l upon delta t. So, that will be the velocity calculation immediately you can calculate the velocity. Now, once you calculate this way you can calculate it the velocity can be calculated and the phase identification can be done based on the refractive index. Now, again the two point optical fiber probe the problem is you can measure only one component of the velocity you cannot measure the all the three component of the velocity and if the bubble is passing through certain angle suppose this is the two pin you have used and bubble is coming in this way in this direction what will happen you will see the signal you will record the signal, but now the delta L value is this this is the delta L value not the del this value. And because of this you are actually traveling more distance and we are considering the delta L instead of this delta L we are calculating this delta L. So, you will get a error in the velocity measurement and in the gas liquid system because of the lift forces involved as we have already discussed the bubble changes its path it does not move vertically up it moves somewhere it is in this direction in this way or maybe it is changing the path continuously it is going like a plume in this way. What will happen in this case you will have an error in the velocity measurement because you are not measuring the direction through which the bubble is coming we are assuming that it is raging up vertically upward. So, that is the way the velocity error has been generated. So, what we do we use four point optical fiber probe where this is placed like this. So, one point one needle is been at the they are been kind of put all this four needle on a equilateral triangle the first needle or the longer needle is placed on the centroid of that equilateral triangle and there is a other or on the three different points of the equilateral triangles like this the way it has been there. So, this C is central needle 1 2 3 is the needle which is on the top. Now, what will happen the bubble will come it will first see the central lozen and then it will move up. Now, once it will move up if the bubble diameter is big enough it will touch all the four probes if not it will touch only the two probes you will get the delta t and you will get the velocity. Now, because it is touching this if suppose some bubble is moving it in this way it will touch only these two you will get that the component of the velocity we know that if it is touching these two it will be coming in this direction.
So, in that way you can calculate the all the three component of the velocity v x, v y, v z ok all the three component of the velocity. You can also calculate the diameter of the bubble and you can also calculate the volume fraction measurement. How you can calculate the volume fraction measurement? Because you are identifying the phase and you can find it out the area under the curve for which the phase is coming in contact with that probe. So, with that area under the curve it means that the total the, the time the fraction of the time if you are doing this if you take say you will always see this kind of a curve. So, area under the curve of this where the bubble is coming into the contact and the total measurement time this will give you a time area under the curve will give you a time total measurement time and the area under the curve once the bubble comes into the contact these two the ratio of these two will give you the volume fraction. So, that is the way to measure the volume fraction also it works also on the transmission method we will discuss it once we will do the volume fraction measurement technique once we will discuss that technique. So, in this way it goes and then what happen you calculate the velocity ok. So, that is the good thing here that you can calculate all the three direction velocity because optical fiber probe thickness is very less the equipment size or this probe size is very less compared to the hard wire anemometer. Hard wire anemometer is really big here it comes you reduce the size drastically and therefore, the intrusive nature of the flow the disturbance in the flow can be minimized. But there is another problem and the problem is because of the piercing. So, what happened? Let me show you the photograph which is taken from the Jew et al in 2004. If the bubble comes I do not know whether you are able to see, but if you see that there is a different pins the fourth pin you are not able to see this is the four point optical fiber probe. So, this is the size which is there and it is zoomed size. So, what will happen? This bubble will come and it will pierce through the first needle. You can see that it has pierced actually through the first needle. Now, once it is pierced through the first needle, now it will move upward and it will pierce through the all the other needle the way it has been shown here and it will pass through. So, what will happen? You will see the signal, but what is problem? It is not an on off signal you are going to see. So, it is piercing through. So, it is being there for certain time. It is being in touch with the needle for a certain time and because of that instead of dating an off and on signal like this way instead of dating this you actually get a signal which is of this nature. So, you will see that they will it will take certain time to rise to the voltage it will stay there for certain time and then it will come down. So, the problem comes now if suppose you have this kind of output the problem comes where we should take the delta t. So, delta l is fixed, but what should be the delta t value and that create a problem why because this delta t values is going to be very very small in the order of microseconds or so. Now, a small error in that delta t measurement will cost you a lot in the velocity why because you are having using delta x by delta t. So, the error in the velocity is very small error in the velocity will cost you heavily in terms of the velocity measurement and therefore, this creates a problem the piercing also create a problem different people do it it in a different type the way to find the delta t value. But it has been proven by Mude et al that uh, who is the professor in TU Delft in his paper who is pub which is published in this chemical engineering science that if you do not do the measurement properly or delta t measurement properly you can have a huge error which can be in order of 100 to 200 percent that error you can generate and that is the limitation of the optical fiber probe. Second limitation of the optical fiber probe is suppose if the discrete phase fraction is very high say bubble density is very high then what will happen multiple bubble may approach the probe at the same time or before the first bubble peers out the second bubble come into the contact. What will happen you will not get the clean signal and you will miss lot of things. So, that is the second problem. Third problem is again the wire thickness the optical fiber probe thickness is very very small as I have shown you here. If the solid is present the solid fraction is very high there may is a possibility that your probe may be get braked. So, that is the another disadvantage of this thing this optical fiber probe otherwise the accuracy is higher it is relatively less costlier compared to whatever we are going to discuss in the non invasive measurement. The non invasive measurement is being preferred in that what is the major good point whatever I am keep on saying on all the measurements that your flow may change at the point of measurement itself the intrusive nature will increase that can be reduced by using the non invasive velocity measurement techniques. 
So, what we do in the non invasive velocity measurement technique, the first non invasive velocity measurement technique which has been developed in late 1984 and all is the laser of Doppler anemometer. Now, again this is being developed initially for the single phase flow and later on it has been utilized to investigate the multi phase flow reactors. So, what is the principle of this measurement technique? This is very simple what you can do you use the laser light and because the laser light is in the optical range and it can go inside of the system what you do you use a laser light, you use a beam splitter, you break the laser light to the two different laser light and that laser lights actually is being focused by using a sending lens or focal length at a measurement point. So, they what we do? We use the laser light, we break it the laser light by using the beam splitter and a mirror to the two laser light. We put we take a lens, we focus these two lights on the lens and then the lens what it does it converges it to the particular location and that location is inside the flow of interest of the inside the region of interest where you want to measure the flow. It go to that point where the two laser light cuts we know that once the two source laser light cuts or two optical lights cuts or two lights cut we form a fringes some bright fringes and dark fringes. So, by bright and dark fringes you get and the distance between the bright fringes and dark fringes can be exactly calculated suppose if this angle is theta then the distance between this bright fringes two successive bright fringes or dark fringes say d if this is the distance d can be calculated as lambda upon sin theta by 2. So, you can exactly find that what will be the distance between the two fringes. Now, what we do we seed the flow with certain particles which are neutrally buoyant the required particles and have a ability to track the phase of interest. So, what we do as we discuss in the multi phase flow if you are tracking the flow with the seed particles you have to see that the Stokes number is very very less than 1 or very low. So, that you can say that they can follow the path of the fluid. So, we use a very small seed particles where Stokes numbers are very very low. So, that they can follow the path of the fluid. So, what will happen that seed particles will pass through it say these are the seeding I have done and once this particle will pass through it this will cut the fringes. And there is another lens which is there which is again and there is a photo detectors which the light emitted from this measurement thing is again being focused to the photo detectors and the photo detector work on the light intensity that amount of the current generated by the photo detector will be proportional to the intensity of the light which is recorded on the photo detector. So, that amount of the current can be converted in terms of the volt. So, you measure the volt generated by this. Now, what happen once the particle will cut it? what will happen there is a velocity there will be some Doppler shift will take place. So, there is an intensity if the nothing is moving you will record certain frequency here. Once a moving particle will come what it will do it will change the intensity of this reflection okay, or this scatter whatever it is being there. Now, because of that the intensity of backward this scatter will change and that change in the intensity or the shift in the intensity or shift in the frequency will be depending on the velocity of this particle and that is the way the Doppler effect comes into the picture. So, if there is a light which is emitting or a wave which is emitting on emitting from a source and if you are having if you are moving towards that wave what will happen you will see the intensity recorded on your ear of that wave or that sound frequency will keep on increasing if you are moving towards the source and it will be decreasing if you are moving out outside of the source and that shift in the frequency is called the Doppler shift. So, similarly if the moving particle will go through this measurement area it will cut the fringes and then what will happen the frequency recorded or intensity recorded of the light on this photo detector will have see a shift and that shift in the frequency is nothing but will be correlated with the velocity of the system. Okay. So, that is the way we measure the velocity or we measure the voltage change if you do that there is a two ways you measure the Doppler shift and you can also measure it that we know the distance between the two successive bright fringes and dark fringes which will be like this and we know that what is the that how the frequency shift will take place or they, if suppose they will cut this bright fringes there will be some change in the frequency some change in the intensity shift the frequency shift will be there Doppler shift will take place and therefore, the intensity will change and the voltage output will change something like this. 
and the time required between these two change delta t can be recorded that is the time between the particle travel from one bright fringes to another bright fringes you will get that delta t you know this d you can calculate the velocity by using d upon delta t okay you can measure the velocity so that is the way you measure the velocity in the laser doppler anemometer again it is non intrusive so this is the major advantage that you can measure the velocity without disturbing the flow and you can measure measuring the velocity again by using the doppler shift and that doppler shift is actually proportional to the velocity of the fluid or velocity of the particle and that particle is the marker of the phase of interest whose velocity you want to map so you can get the velocity of that particular phase okay so that is the way lda measurement has been done the problem in the LDA measurement is it is a point measurement you are cutting this thing at a particular point. So, whatever the velocity you are measuring you are measuring the velocity locally at that point ok you are not measuring velocity at all the locations. So, you are not getting the area average velocity or the how the velocity is changing with the position if you want to do that you have to use several lasers or you need to focus on different places. So, your experimental time will be very high second thing the problem is these all are our lasers are under the optical range. So, because of the optical range frequency they are if my eyes cannot see laser can also not see. So, what means if the system is opaque either the wall of the system is opaque which is true for most of the uh, industry then LDA cannot be used or if suppose even if I make the glass made uh, this wall made of the glass the system may be the wall is uh, transparent. But if the system is opaque once I say system is opaque means if suppose the discrete phase in the gas liquid system the discrete phase bubble fraction is more than 10 percent or 15 percent or 20 percent what will happen it will be completely dense bubble as I have shown you the pictures earlier also. So, what will happen any light which will fall in will actually get reflected or diffracted. So, what you will able to measure you will able to measure only near the wall you cannot measure inside. So, that is the major problem with the LDA that if the discrete phase fraction goes anything above 5 percent the use of LDA is limited though it is very accurate for a single phase flow, but in the multi phase flow this is the major limitation. And most of the reactor we, we use in industry is having a discrete phase fraction more than 5 percent and therefore, it is being limited the application is being limited in the industry. For the gas solid flow the problem comes again if the solid fraction is very high say you are using for the bubbling fluid ice bed or so your all the light will be get refracted or diffracted and you will not able to do any measurement. So, these are the disadvantages of the LDA there are issues with the post processing also if suppose the size of the particle say in multi phase flow generally if we use the bubble we use bubble as itself as a seed particles. Okay. So, in that case if the size of the bubble is too big which can cut the two fringes together your post processing becomes very typical. Okay. So, that also generates some error inside. So, this is the disadvantage of the LDA, but the advantage of the LDA is the spatial resolution is very very high it goes in the order of say less than 0.1 mm or even lower that is the spatial resolution is very high if you use a high speed laser you can even increase the temporal resolution of this. So, this can gives you the phenomenon change with the time how the velocity is changing, but the major problem is it gives the point measurement it cannot be used for high discrete phase concentration. Okay. So, this is the post processing scheme which we have already discussed that what you do you calculate the speed by the spacing between the fringes and the time required of the frequency of this curve. So, what we do we take this frequency we do the Fourier transform and we make this frequency we do the filtering of that with the putting the band pass filter and we convert that in terms of a proper waves and that the frequency you calculate that what is this f this is delta t. So, delta t 1 upon delta t is f or you can say this is will be 1 upon f frequency you can get you can get the speed of uh, this will be fringe spacing into the f this is the slide which has been taken from the major main science enterprises inc which supplies the LDA which are the also supplier of the LDA. So, we do it in this way and there we measure the velocity of the fluid. The only problem I said that is you do the point measurement. So, you get the position velocity change with the time, but you did not get the velocity change with the position. So, that you do not get second thing you cannot use it for the higher discrete phase fraction. 
Now, to remove the first part that you are doing only point measurement, another technique is being introduced or being used and that is called particle image velocimetry. Now, what we do in particle image velocimetry, we generate a laser sheet instead of a laser cutting the two laser at a particular point, what we do we generate a laser sheet. So, this is the laser sheet, there is optics which is being used, I am not going in detail of this. You can if you are interested, you can go and see the optics, they are very interesting to understand all these optics. So, if we use a laser source, we use some optics where we generate the laser sheet. So, this is the laser sheet is being generated, we use camera either a high speed camera or the CMOS camera or uh, this kind of a CCD camera which is double pulse camera, we use that and we use the laser which is the double frequency laser. Now, or this uh, you, the laser frequency can be generated in a small domain. So, what we do? We do a laser, we put a laser sheet, we generate a laser sheet inside the flow, we put some particle which actually eliminate lights in presence of the laser. So, we use double pulse laser, we use the CCD camera in the older version of the PIV. Now, what we do? We use either the continuous laser and this uh, high speed camera or we use still the double pulse laser and high speed camera and we acquire the velocity in kind of images with the time and we process it. So, we will discuss about it, but what we do say the conventional PIV technique, we use the double pulse laser. So, it generates the two pulse in a very short duration. You eliminate, you make a laser sheet, you eliminate the whole flow field, we seed it with the tracer particle the way we are doing it in the LDA. Now, again we are using the seed particles, it means the Stokes number should be very low. You have to see that the seed particles is exactly following the path of the fluid. Now, once the seed particles will go inside, in the presence of the laser light, they will eliminate light, you record the image. Then you trip the laser and again after certain time, you again kind of switch on the laser. So, they give the two pulses of the laser. Now, once you give the pulse, the light will be emitted, photographs will be captured, and either the light will be emitted, photographs will be captured. So, we will have two images. We cross correlate these two images and try to find it out the velocity. Now, how we do that cross correlation? We have say image 1 at 1 pulse and image 2 at the second pulse. So, you understood how we are getting the image. So, lights are being emitted, the laser light is there, these particles are emitting the lights under the laser light. So, what will happen once we take the photograph, those particles will come as a bright color. Now, or it will come as a uh, this kind of uh, dark color depending upon what is the particle property, whether it is eliminating the light or whether it is absorbing the light, both kind of things can be used. Now, you will get the image, you will get the particles. Okay. Now, what we need to do? We need to find the velocity. So, this is suppose this two images and these are the seed particles. We dump lot of seed particles so that image density is very high. Now, what we do? We divide the whole picture, this whole image into the small pixels. Okay. So, this is one pixel I am talking about and there are few number of particles is there. Then, we take the FFT, we do the kind of Fourier transform. And then the second again image we take, we do the FFT in the Fourier transform of this image and then we cross correlate the Fourier transforms of these two images. If needed, we do the filtering also. Again, I am not going in detail of all those filters, but what you then do, suppose this is the Fourier, if you do the Fourier transform, you will get a function f which is u and v. The second image, again you will get a function g which is the function of u and v. You cross correlate this two. And with the cross correlation, what you do, say you take one particle, you try to cross correlate this particle in the second image with all these particles or vice versa. You take one particle in the first image and you try to do the cross correlation with the, all the other particles in the second image and with the cross correlation for each and then you do it for the second particle, third particle, fourth particle, whatever the particle available and you get a cross correlation index. You do the inverse FFT and you find that the displacement a specific displacement for each particle or the combined displacement for the each particle. So, each particle cross correlation you will get how well it is cross correlated. So, it means suppose this is the particle I can cross correlating with all the particles. I will find that which is the particle which is having a better cross correlation coefficient with this particle in the second image say this is the particle. So, earlier the image this distance was this now the distance is this I will get a small displacement. Similarly, I will do for all the particles, I will get the combined cross correlation index and that will give some peak and with that combined cross correlation index, what we will get, we will get the average displacement of all the particle. So, we get the displacement, we get the delta x from the cross correlation 
and delta t we already know we know that what is the time of the double pulse so you know the delta t you can calculate the velocity and that is the way the velocity is being calculated in the piv experiments the problem in the traditional piv experiment is if you are not using a high speed camera you will not get a time resolved picture your spatial resolution will be very high but your temporal resolution will be low and therefore, now a time resolved PIV experiments or PIV measurement technique has been developed where we use a high speed camera, we eliminate the flow with the laser, we use either the continuous laser and keep on observing or we keep on recording the images with the time. Now, it is a high speed camera which record the images at a different pace and now you correlate between these two images and you get the time resolved the PIV that how with the time the flow is changing. So, you have a continuous image now. Okay. So, that is the time resolved PIV experiments. Now, advantage of the PIV is obviously it is in, it has given the luxury to analyze the complete flow field at one shot at least the region of interest complete region of interest you can analyze at one shot you do not need to do multiple experiments like LDA. So, this gives you the complete information of the flow field that is the major advantage over the LDA technique the kind of the accuracy is higher the temporal resolution can be improved a lot by using the high speed camera, but the major limitation remains same that if the system is opaque of wall of the system is opaque or the system itself is opaque though the wall is transparent, but because of the higher discrete phase fraction or higher solid concentration the system is opaque you will not able to get anything because the camera will not able to see if your eyes are not able to see. So, if you are not able to see till the center of the column you will not able to the camera will also not able to see and your information will be limited only near the wall and that poses the major problem or you can say the major issue with this technique. So, you can use it for the dilute phase or when the discrete phase fraction is less than 5 percent, but if the discrete phase fraction is more than that ideally you cannot use this technique and that poses the major limitation. And therefore, the optical waste techniques are used in the multiphase flow reactors a lot, but cannot be used at all the scales cannot be used at industry or cannot be used when the discrete phase fraction is really high though their accuracy is better. And therefore, radiation based technique is being developed and in the radiation based technique the first technique is positron emission particle tracking. Now, what we do in the positron emission particle tracking we track the motion we seed the particle or we seed the flow with a positron source and we track the motion of that particle. So, what we do suppose there is a gas solid system we take a positron source say we take a positron particle the source which can emit the positron particle and we match the size, shape and density of this tracer particle exactly as of the other solids present in the flow. And if suppose you want to track the motion of the liquid, we will match the density of this particle exactly as the density of the fluid you want to track. Okay. Now, what we do there are certain detectors which are placed around and you track the motion of the particle. Now, how you track the motion of the particle? We know that one positron emission source will actually emit a positron and electrons are available in huge amount around the system. Okay. So, bulk of the electrons are available. So, the moment a positron is emitted it annihilates with the electron. So, what happened there is a positron it means E plus it annihilates or it combined with electron once they comes together they generate two gamma rays. Okay. And this gamma rays are 180 degree apart back to back it means one gamma suppose this this is the positron this is positron, this is a electron, they annihilate each other and they generate two back to back gamma rays which would be 180 degree apart okay, and back to back they will move. We put a complex detector system around the vessel of interest say we put some detector system complex this detector systems are really complex which can detect simultaneously these two gamma rays which is being emitted from the source. And only those detection which is simultaneous on both the detectors is considered as an event. So, you get that this line that how the simultaneous detection is there. Now, depending upon this certain this uh, source intensity gamma ray uh, kind of beta this positron emission will be number of positron emitted per unit time will be huge. So, what will happen you will see that several such lines. Okay. And these lines wherever they will cut each other that will be the location of the particle. So, what we do say this is the annihilation 
they say one is the electron one is the positron once they inhalate they produce two back to back gamma rays now because they are gamma rays they can travel in any medium they will go and detect it on the system this detector system so say this is my detector assembly they will be detected and their detection will be simultaneous if suppose some gamma rays is got scattered or attenuated that detection will not be counted if suppose the gamma ray is detected only on one detector that will not be counted only the simultaneous detection of the gamma rays on both the detector will be counted so what you will, will give it will give you a line so you will be knowing that my particle is within this line now several such interactions will take place depending upon the intensity of the source now it means each interaction is going to give me a line so you will get this kind of a line i am showing only three lines because only three line is needed to calculate the position of the particle but in reality you will get several such line you will get several such line where the particles will be detected so what you will get out of all these events you need only three events which will be cutting each other to get the particle position so i will say that this is my particle position now particle will be free to move inside and therefore you will able to get the particle position with the time you know the particle position with the time by using delta x upon delta t you can calculate the velocity of the particle now the particle will move in all the three directions so you will get the displacement in x y and z so what you will get you can get the v as a function of x y and z with the time and you will get all the component of the v it means you will get the vx you will get the vy you will get the vz all the component of the v you will get and how it is changing with the time so that is the major advantage of the pept and because you are using gamma rays what you, is, you are going to get you can use it even for the opaque system okay the only thing is that here the kind of the size the this uh, the only problem here is that you are using gamma rays so the safety requirement is there and the detection system is very very complex they are very complex detector detection system second thing is that the diameter of the particle the labeling particle is generally is in the range of 100 micrometer it means around 0.1 mm it cannot be lower than that so any structure which will be lower than that you will not able to track it and then kind of the time of acquisition is generally limited at around 1 millisecond so that is the kind of limitation in terms of the spatial resolution and temporal resolution but the one of the major advantage is that you don't need any calibration you don't need to put the particle inside the way i have said for the invasive technique you don't need any calibration here because you know you are solving it with the triangulation theory so that is the major advantage second advantage is you can because it's a gamma ray system you can use it for the opaque system also but the major advantage disadvantage is that the detection systems are very complex this is the paper work has been done by parker et al which they have investigated the flow profile inside the rotary plane and a bubbling fluid ice bed but you can see that the detector systems are very very complex very bulky system and they are very complex as you require the simultaneous detection of the gamma rays and that's why the cost of this technique is enormously high and therefore the use is very limited and only the parker group which is university of birmingham who is placed in university of birmingham has this technique available because this is very costly okay second disadvantage is the annihilation generate a gamma ray energy of 511 kev that will be the energy you will generate and it means you cannot use the system this energy is limited so if the system diameter is very big you cannot use it so suppose if you want to use it at industrial scale fluid ice bed or boilers where the diameter may be of several meters you cannot use this technique because the gamma ray will be the scattered or attenuated inside the system itself and that is the disadvantage of pept okay and therefore another technique has been developed which is called radioactive particle tracking technique in this technique what we do we again use the same concept as in the pept instead of now positron emission positron particle we use a gamma ray particle directly now using the gamma ray particle directly gives you a luxury that you can use any intensity of your choice you can use any energy of your choice so it gives you the flexibility to use the technique for any diameter system for any solid fraction or phase fraction system for the opaque system also so either your made wall is made of wall or anything the diameter of the system is very high discrete phase fractions are very high you are using with the solids or bubbling fluid ice bed of 40% uh, solids you can use it 
Okay. So, that is the major advantage of this technique. It gives you lot of flexibility and that is why this technique is very versatile and can be used at every scale for the different type of the system. And what we do in this technique, we use a marker of, we use a single radioactive particle which is marker of the phase of interest whose velocity you want to map. So, suppose in a gas solid fluidized bed, suppose there is a solid you want to map the position of motion of the solid you make one of the particle as a radioactive or you make use a radioactive particle with size, shape and density is exactly same as of the particles present in the flow and you track the motion of this particle. In case of the liquid what you do this is like a picture of the bubble column where gas liquid flow is there you make the liquid neutral this particle neutrally buoyant to the liquid. So, what will happen it will follow the path of the fluid. Now, the size of the particle should be smaller so that the Stokes number of the particle is low and it is following the path of the fluid exactly and you track the motion of this particle and how we track the motion of the particle. Now, during because this is a gamma ray source during its part it will emit the gamma rays. We put some scintillation detectors which are being mint to adsorb those gamma rays or count those photons which is emitted by the particles and we place this scintillation detector strategically around the vessel of interest so that you can cover the entire zone of interest or zone of investigation. We place it properly so that we get the proper resolution and sensitivity and the counts record emitted by this gamma ray is being recorded on these detectors. Now, by using the Beer Lambert's law, we know that the intensity recorded on the detector will be the function of the distance and the attenuation coefficient. So, i equal to i naught into e raised to the power minus mu l. And therefore, because it will be going to the attenuation coefficient, you need that we know that if the particle is closer to the detector, you will get higher counts on the detector. If the particle is far, you will get the lower counts. So, by using the suitable reconstruction algorithm, we reconstruct the position of the particle by measuring the counts on detect each detector. So, each detector acquired the counts at the same time, we get again the same principle distance from each detector and that distance from each detector will coincide to a particular location of the particle. So, we get the location of the particle. So, what we get is that how the particle position is changing with the time from there again by using delta x by delta t we calculate the velocity and then again we can calculate the all the three components say v x, v y, v z of the particle and we can find it out that how the velocity is changing with the position and with the time that all you can do the calculation. Now, how you reconstruct and what we do suppose this is experimental set of photographs this is the uh, gas solid column these are the scintillation detectors which are being used to adsorb the count and we put a say solid particle inside. Now, this particle will move inside freely and you will see this kind of a count. So, y axis is a count and x axis is a time. So, you will see that how the counts on each detector is changing. In this experiment, we have used 8 detectors. So, you can see that there is a 3 detector 1, 2 and 3 on this graph, 4, 5 and 6 on this graph which is combined with the red, blue and green color and red and green on this too. So, 8 detectors how the counts on all the 8 detectors are changing. Now, you do the calibration that is the major disadvantage of this. So, what we do initially we put the particle at several known location for in situ condition. We find that how the counts on each detector will change once you would put the particle at a particular location for the given operating condition. So, we know that how the count will change for a particular location of the particle in the calibration stage. In the real experiment stage, we know that how the count on the detector is changing. We match these two counts, we get the position. So, understood we do that say this is my column. What we do initially at operating conditions at in situ condition, it means the condition at which you want to do the measurement we first place the particle say anyhow at a certain location and we record that how much is the count is being recorded by all these detectors. Then we change the location we do it the same thing at the several location. Now, we generate a distance count map for all the particles all the detectors for each location of the particle you will, all this detector will record some count. So, we generate we note it down we generate a distance count map for all this detector for the known location of the particle, we know the particle location, we know the detector, we know the distance and then we record the counts for the in situ condition. In the real experiment, particle is free to move inside wherever it wants to go. 
now the particle what we do we record the counts on the detector with the time so in the calibration with the position how the count is being recorded on each detector in real experiment with the time how the count is recorded on each detector now we compare these two and once you compare these two what you will get you will get that how the position of the particle is changing with the time so you will get this that suppose this particle has started in this place how it is changing its position how it is changing its position with the time you get that now by using the delta x by delta t you get the velocity that is the lagrangian velocity time series earlier you get the lagrangian position time series that how the position of the particle is changing with the time now we got the lagrangian velocity time series with delta x by delta t you will get the vx how the vx component is changing with the time how is vy component is changing with the time how is vz component is changing with the time now to get how the velocity is changing with the position we do the eulerian we form eulerian grid we discretize the column in a virtual small grids virtually and we see that in each grid how many times the particle is coming so say in each grid in each cell if the particle stays during the whole time of experiment say 8 or 10 hours if you are acquiring the data if the particle comes 100 times we take a average and we say that is the position velocity at this cell similarly we do it for all the location and we found that how the particle velocity is changing with the position and we get the mean velocity now once you have a mean velocity i already have the local velocity i can get the fluctuation so i can get that how the fluctuation is changing with the time how the fluctuation of the particle is changing with the position all the things we can calculate and that's why this gives this technique gives you a rich database to do the detailed analysis of the flow the only disadvantage of this technique is the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution is lower it is much lower compared to the ldi and piv it is in the order of 0.1 mm or 1 mm in between the 0.1 mm to 1 mm depending upon how many number of detectors you are using what is your tracer particle size now the that is the disadvantage another disadvantage is this is a radiation based technique so required lot of safety gadgets you need to take a proper approval before installing this technique in your laboratory or before using this technique in your industry so that is the disadvantage the major advantage is it's very versatile technique it is kind of uh, it can be implemented at all the scales with the equal accuracy the another disadvantage of this technique is or limitation why this technique uh, is a major you can say the limitation of this technique is the calibration required so what you need to do you need to do the calibration at in situ condition and therefore if the medium is very hostile say it is a very high temperature high pressure reactor doing the calibration at in situ condition may be difficult and which limits the application of this technique neither otherwise this technique is very versatile for any solid fraction for any kind of a condition say wall is opaque or it's a transparent solid fraction is small or higher it's a smaller equipment laboratory scale equipment or it's a industrial scale equipment you can implement it everywhere so that gives the versatility so with this this is a typical photograph of this technique with this your velocity measurement technique is over and in next class we'll briefly discuss about the phase fraction measurement technique thank you